There she is. Hey. Hello, Na. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Natalie, let me introduce you to my 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 awesome buddy Jamil. Jamil is my cousin Natalie. How you Hi. doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> all right, and to all the people out there, um, to the McLean personnel, this is Natalie Arias. Uh, she was the center back for the Columbia national team. Um, she was all. She also attended O'Connell High School, mm -hmm. um, and then from there went to Maryland University. And went on to have a professional career with the career with the Columbia national team. So we'll just start off, and if you could just give a little bit of background of where you grew up, maybe your club team, um, and, and things like that. All right. Well, cool. Um, well, thanks everybody for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, McLean is definitely uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I was with the McLean club. Um, from age, I believe, 9 to 15, um, played with the McLean Pride um, during that time when the club was much smaller <laughs> than what you guys have now. Um, so it was just a itty bitty little club. Um, and, but yeah, it was uh, exciting to build something from, from, the, from the grassroots up uh, but, and see what it's become, which is a powerhouse, which has always been exciting to see. Um, but I grew up in Alexandria, Virginia, um, you know, Northern Virginia kid, did ODP with Virginia, Virginia State ODP, Region 1, um, and started out uh, club soccer, when, or, you know, rec soccer with Annandale Boys and Girls Club. Um, that was my first kind of house and, um, you know, uh, rec experience, and then um, did that with my brother, and um, I have a younger brother, um, and we both played basketball and soccer and uh, kind of did that rec league and then um, just had a passion for soccer and got into um, the Vista Club and uh, started travel soccer around age, age seven um, and then did that uh, and then was on the Vista Club for about two years and went to McLean. Um, most, of, most of my formative years was with McLean Club, McLean Pride and then um, went to high school, Bishop O'Connell High School, which is in Arlington, Virginia, um, private school there. So uh, I actually played uh, high school soccer, but it was in the fall, a little bit different than uh, public school in Virginia. And um, then went on to, um, luckily was blessed to get a uh, four-year college scholarship to uh, University of Maryland. So I am a Terp, um, played there for four years, and um, then went on to uh, represent my parents' home country of Colombia. Uh, started in about 2010, and um, my last competition, well, actually about 2009-ish, um, and my last competition was in uh, 2016 in the Rio Olympics. So uh, had about 60 caps with the uh, national team, uh, the senior women's national team, and um, yeah, so it was just an uh, incredible experience, um, you know, for me just to kind of get back to um, my ancestral roots um, and get to visit a lot of, uh, you know, areas that I hadn't since I was either very small or hadn't been back to uh, my parents' home country for many years. Um, and so it was an incredible experience uh, for me and my family, um, which, you know, for me, uh, uh, you know, a sense of pride and something I'm super proud of that I got to kind of take them along in, on the ride with me. Um, and uh, Alan and most of my cousins, for, for those of you who don't know, Alan is my cousin um, and uh, one of my oldest cousins. And, um, you know, we always, we always um, had a passion for football um, in our household and, you know, all family gatherings usually ended up into you know, boys versus girls and playing one-on-one -on -one or something. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it was just incredible to kind of have them along for the ride as well. Uh, and that support system is what helped, you know, to get me to that level because um, you don't do it by yourself. It definitely takes uh, a, a pretty large support system to um, get to that level uh, and to reach that and to consistently stay at the elite level. Um, so, 
so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me and kind of my journey um, through the U.S. and international. Beautiful. So let me ask you, taking it back towards your, your, the end of your youth career and, and getting recruited and things like that, how was your recruiting process with Maryland? Um, so again, so, uh, you know, a lot of things I think have changed <laughs> since I was being recruited. Um, so I'm not as uh, up to speed with what the changes that the NCAA has probably made since when I was being recruited. Um, but I always played up. Um, I tended to be around players that were about two years older than I was, sometimes three years older, but mostly two years older in school. Um, so I actually got recruited a lot younger than most. Um, so I ended up going to college so showcases when I was in um, eighth grade to um, freshman year of high school. So I did have a lot of exposure. Um, and, you know, but it was kind of the same, same rules, like they couldn't talk to me until I was, you know, a junior um, in high school. But, you know, a lot of my teammates were getting recruited around um, or just getting recruited um, through my club uh, and through my club team. And we were just invited to a lot of different showcases. Um, and I did learn something through the system that I know that I did not take advantage of, but I know it's something that I learned actually when I was in college, which was a lot of people or a lot of players, if they have a school that they love and or a style of play or system that they kind of really speaks to them, um, they would go to the, the soccer camps, the, the college university camps. Um, and that's when, when we were players, um, we would have to work those camps um, for the university. And it was just a great place for us to uh, be able to train um, but also uh, we would get exposure to some of these younger, younger players that were excited and wanting to be in the college system um, and were, were aspiring to probably play either for that university or in that conference. Um, so that wasn't something that I really did. Um, I usually, my summers were with um, playing in regionals and or then immediately going to region one camp. Um, which was usually a grueling like year, or I'm sorry, like week camp um, with two, three days. Um, it was always During something summer. that, yeah, it was always like summers were very slam packed. Um, but uh, it's definitely always something that I, that I always encourage is if you know of a university that you're interested in, um, look into their summer programs because they usually have some type of clinic, some type of summer camp. It could be overnight or it could be day camps or something like that. Those are really good places that, you know, if you don't happen to be in some of these showcases that um, other players get invited to, you're going to get the attention of not only the current players, but the current staff. And there's usually like staff games and things like that where, those players get an opportunity to play with us. So I always thought that that was a really cool thing that um, I only knew about once I was a college player. Um, so it's always something that I tell high school kids um, to look into because it's one thing that's really underutilized that people don't know about until you go through it. Um, but it's something to take advantage of if you have that opportunity. Awesome, awesome. I gotta ask you this, here's a question here. Uh -huh. Big Big Ten or ACC? Oh, I mean, I, I went to Maryland because it was an ACC school. So. At that time, right? <laughs> yeah, now they're the Big Ten. ACC all the way, yeah. No, I, I, unfortunately, it's hard for me to <laughs> kind of know that we're a Big Ten school. But right. I went to Maryland because it was in the ACC and because it was in the best women's and men's conference in the country. Um, and I knew I was going to get the best playing environment and I grew up playing with boys. So I knew, Hey, it's the best pickup I can get <laughs> in the country. <laughs> um, so, uh, and plus for me, it was huge that, uh, my family could come see me play. Um, cause again, they sacrificed so much to get me that opportunity. Um, and so I thought it was just kind of paying it forward that, you know, my parents could be at my games, my brother could be at my games. Because that just, that meant a lot to me. Um, but yeah, totally ACC all the way. <laughs> Jamil, you got, a, you got a question? Yeah, were you always a defender? And if so, like what made you pick that position? Why do you love that position? What 
what about playing that in the defense is fits your personality or, you know, what are the qualities you feel like uh, made it work for you? All right. Great question. Um, I actually was not a defender for most of my <laughs> career. Um, I was actually always a center midfielder. Um, I grew up playing offensive center midfielder. Uh, and then as I transitioned into U.S. national team camps, um, it was kind of more defensive or sitting um, center midfielder. Um, and then it was progressively um, let's try you in the back line uh, because some of the some of the area or some of the um, the qualities that I had as a player were really conducive to a defender. So I was very aggressive. I um, anticipated the ball very well, um, and I was really good in the air and really good in long with long balls, um, just precision kind of passing. So um, a lot of that stuff as I got you know I got into Region, regional camps or U.S. Youth National Team camps, um, that was always something where um, those, were, oh, those were easy for me, but actually one-on-one -on -one defending and understanding tactically how you work within a system didn't come as easy. Um, and so it was always a challenge for me, and it was something that the national team coaches always challenged me in camps to be like, I know this is uncomfortable, but you need to be able to learn how to be comfortable within these uncomfortable situations because that's mm -hmm. where the, um, the elite learn where to live and yep. how to compete in that, in that uh, arena. So um, I was a midfielder, and so I just had a lot of those. Um, I just I love to, to score, um, and so that was something that, you know, I transitioned where – I was going to bring that as a defender or whatever I had. <laughs> um, and so as I, as I progressed in, on the international stage, um, it was, it was uh, you know, I was very lucky and I had a really, really good coach once I transitioned to the Colombian national team who was a defender. Um, and I just wanted to play. And so for me, it was, hey, uh, where, you know, when I came onto the team, the midfield was stacked and they had a very particular style of play and they looked at my size and they were like, Hey, you're a defender. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just <clears throat> want to play. And so I was like, Hey, put me anywhere and I'll learn. And, you know, a lot of defending is a mentality. Um, and so I just really kind of had to buy into that physicality and the mentality to, um, to want to win every one-on-one, -on -one, to learn tactically how to move with my other uh, with my other teammates, um, and just how that worked into the system that we had tactically. Uh, and in my first World Cup, I was a outside back. Um, I was a right outside back, and um, I played that for my first um, my first basically Olympic cycle. So the first kind of four years on the on the women's national team. And then my second cycle, I transitioned to a center back, which was probably a little bit more comfortable for me. Um, and it was a little bit more natural. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was a transition for me. It was something that was always a challenge. Um, and it's, it's actually something that um, looking back on my journey, it's always gratifying because as a, as a teenager in the U.S. youth system, I was actually told probably two or three times through national team camps, like, hey, you know, you, you got the technical piece, you have a, you know, you have a great technical foundation, but I need you to really kind of buy into defending because that's really what's going to help you at the next level. Um, and so it was always a difficult kind of humbling thing to hear because I was like, wait, I'm technical, I score goals, what else could you want? And in order to be a complete player, you got to do everything. And part of that is defending. And part of that is being a good teammate and tactically being able to do what's necessary within a system. And um, that's what was necessary for me to get to the next level. And so I just completely bought in and completely uh, transformed myself and how I trained to really uh, be an elite defender. Awesome. Um, a couple questions from from the some of the attendees. Um, Ava asks, besides soccer practice practices, how many hours on your own did you play soccer per day before you got to college when you were a youth player? 
Um, so for me, I, uh, I was, I was lucky, you know, I, I had a, a little bit of a different, um, upbringing or household, I think than most. Um, so, you know, football in my house was, and sorry if I confuse people, I say football and that means soccer. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was religion in my house. <laughs> so it was, you know, always on TV. I was always watching games. I mean, I got more into kind of analyzing. Dad was a coach. Right. Dad was my coach. <laughs> um, you know, my dad was a professional player in South America. Um, and so, I mean, I started training at a really young age. I mean, I would say like I started, um, doing it fairly consistently probably from age eight um until i went to college and and for me that looked like um you know the 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 weekends were the games and that was where i got to express myself and i got to kind of you know work or not work on but do everything that i had been working on for that past week or try you know try new things um but I always had those two practices a week with my club and then every other day it was at least two hours of ball work um, and then as I got older it was probably um, in the mornings you know it was five five thirty to six thirty before school um, you know training with my dad or you know training against the wall uh, so hey <laughs> um, so it was always a uh, so, you know, it was always consistent for me. Um, you know, club practice I loved um, because, again, I got to um, I got to train and I got to be with, um, you know, a great set of players that always challenged me. Um, but where I really honed my technical foundation and learned how to master craft was on my own. And, um, and that was always at least two hours probably a day. Um, but you know, my mom made sure that I did my homework first. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna ask is how big of, how big of academic uh, role did academics play in, in terms of your recruiting or just how, how important was that in terms of getting in, uh, into Maryland and things like that? Yeah. So, um, academics in my house was also, it came first. Um, you know, my mom was always very, very much provided a balance in my home where it was, you know, if you're going to go get a scholarship, the scholarship says you're a student athlete and it says student first. So you have to have the same discipline, the same um, time management skills, organization that you would, that you use to train, you have to use that as a student. Um, and so um, academically, I always made sure that I was always in a good place so that um, I, didn't, I didn't create any unnecessary obstacles for myself in college recruiting. So I made sure that my GPA was in a good place. Um, I made sure that the principles that I had as a player always applied to the classroom. So some things came easier for me than others, but I knew that I wasn't gonna get outworked. So if that meant I had to spend more time in a certain subject than others, I did that. Um, and I always maintained um, throughout high school, it was always, above like a three seven, I would say. So I just made sure that that was never an issue for me for college recruiting, um, because those are barriers, unfortunately, that we can create for ourselves if we're not in a good academic um, situation. So um, made sure of that, obviously my mom helped <laughs> made sure of that as well for my brother and I. Um, and, uh, but yes, it was important. Um, and it made, it made everything easy because, you know, I could spend more time training or I could spend more time, um, you know, or, or it was easier to kind of say, hey, I, I want to go play pickup or, you know, instead, I, you know, I don't go straight home. I go to this facility and go play pickup for a couple hours. But yeah. my parents knew that I was going to get my work done. So it wasn't ever, you know, I wasn't yep. picking and choosing. Um, what, what would you, why did you, I guess, cause you, I, it sounded like you play with the youth national team here, um, a bit. Why did, why did you end up choosing to play in the world cup with Columbia? So, um, you know, for me, it was always, it was always important. Like family has always been number one for me. Um, and you know, the style of play and how I was trained to approach the game and and just the style and the flair I think that I loved about it was very South American. It was super South American influenced. Um, 
And as I got older, you know, I learned that in within certain systems that I was more, let's say, made or kind of constructed and molded for that style. Um, and, you know, so I, if I approached kind of some obstacles within the USU system that, you know, were not quite how I approached the game, how I saw it. Um, and the South American style or Colombian style in particular, Brazilian, um, it was very much, you know, ball on the ground, technical foundation throughout all positions. We're all interchangeable. Um, so I just, I, I think I felt like the game and the style kind of spoke to me a little bit more. Um, and it just felt more comfortable, I think, for me um, once I got on the international stage. And I felt like I wanted to, I always wanted to make an impact uh, wherever I went. And I felt like I was going to make more of a, more of an impact bringing some of the, some of the, um, you know, the parts of the game that make the women's U.S. national team as great as they are, you know, bringing that to other parts of the world or bringing that into South America, bringing that into that another program yeah. um, would only help the game. And for me, a lot of, a lot of this is always, how can I grow the game? How can I make an impact? Um, and I thought that that was so, that just spoke to me because I was, I, I, I just, and I love the idea of really learning where I came from, learning about my roots. Um, and that was always really important to me. And I was always very proud of being Colombian yeah. um, and being a, being a Hispanic American. And so um, it was just, it was just the best of, of both worlds. And it was just an experience that I'm truly grateful for because I really just got the best um, experience that I, that I could have growing up here and, and learning everything that makes the U.S. Youth okay. national team as great as it is um, and that system, um, but then also taking it to another part of the world and um, making it also elite. So Yeah, it seems like you're carrying on your, your father's legacy in a sense that, you know, you're able to, to – give back um, to, to the country, your native country. What, how, and in that line of thought, how difficult was it, or what was the process like getting identified and then going back? And then was there any, you know, trans issues with, with, with dealing with you, you not obviously being from there and, and uh, you know, how was that clicking with the national team players from that, that lived there? Um, was that a difficult process um, at all for you? So, um, it, it was, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would characterize it as difficult. It was just, I mean, I guess talk about just being like being humbled and being like uncomfortable and having to, you know, check your ego at the door and just say, Hey, this is me. I want to be the best. This is how I know how to do it. And if you want to do the same thing, then let's make history. Let's make this happen kind of thing. Um, and, but it's just a different culture. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a different way of approaching life, of approaching football, of approaching training. Um, so it was just a humbling experience for me to just learn what the system is like there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was, it's kind of odd because I mean, it's not as it's not as structured as obviously the US youth system is. So I remember what it was like to just be identified for, you know, a U sixteen national team. I mean, that was weeks and weeks of going to um, ODP ODP tryouts and then doing then doing states and then doing region one and then doing the interregional and you know, um, and then going to other and then going to numerous camps before you get to go to a competition and yeah. you know, numerous times where you have to make a roster or not and testing and all that. Well, you know, in South America, it's uh, it was simply the U20 women in 2009 made history where they placed fourth in the world uh, in Germany before the 2011 Women's World Cup. Um, for the and it, so Colombia did did amazing. They they placed fourth, and it was an incredible generation of players. 
And I had never really considered playing for the Columbia national team just because I don't know. It just never had occurred to me before. Um, again, probably because I had just been with the USU system for such a long time and I had just graduated from the University of Maryland and had decided that playing overseas just didn't make sense for me um, just because it wasn't, there wasn't much structure at the time when I graduated. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it just took my dad's persistence and he was like, well, why not, you know, they have a great team. It looks like they have some, some youth that's coming up. Like, you know, why, why don't you try? Because, you know, obviously there's going to be two, two teams from South America identified for a women's world cup. Like you still got gas in the tank. And I did, I felt like I still had more to give to the game. I did have more gas in the tank. And I felt like I always knew that I could play at that level. I just hadn't gotten the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, yeah, sure, but let's go for it. And, you know, kind of put almost like a resume together kind of thing. Um, and somehow this very nice lady that works for the Federation, she um, was like, okay, you know, you've called a number of times, so I'm gonna give you his number and just call him. And I think he's in camp right now, but like, I don't know too much information, but don't tell him I gave you the number. <laughs> So my dad calls, um, who is who was the U twenty women's world uh, World Cup uh, head coach, and now he was the head coach of the senior team. He calls him and he's like, "Okay, well, great. She sounds great. So why don't you bring her? Bring her into camp. She needs to be here in seventy two hours." And I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! What do you mean? I'm not ready to go into a national team camp. Like I've just been playing for fun. Like you know." I, no way because I was so used to the U.S. youth system of you know you know you're going to be tested as soon as you go into camp yep. you know what the fitness you know you know what the fitness expectations are you know what the physical demand is you know what the weight training looks like you know you know the the running times and everything you got to get I was like whoa there's no way I can do this but I was like but from a technical standpoint or from a footballer standpoint, I knew I had it, but I was like, you know, doubting myself a little bit. So my dad was like, you know, this is your shot. What are you going to do? So my mom and I got on a plane mm -hmm. <laughs> and we went to Bogota. And for those that don't know, Bogota is in extremely high altitude. So um, the first couple of days, you can feel like it's regular, like you feel like you're at sea level. But then on day three, four, and five, you're like, wait, why can't I run? Like, why am I breathing so hard? And it's because you're so high in altitude. I mean, it's almost double what Denver is. So mm -hmm. it was an extreme change. And I basically had a 10 day tryout um, and, you know, made enough of an impression for them to be like, okay, we'll come back. Um, but the camps were like 20, 25 days. These were not 10 to 14 day camps that we all hear about. I mean, these were long drawn out camps. Um, luckily I had an incredible employer that was very supportive and they were like, go ahead. If this is your dream, go for it. So went for it. Then the last, the, the next camp, um, I had, you know, done very well and kind of had solidified myself as, you know, a top probably a top 15 player at the time. And so they were like, okay, you're going to go to Ecuador. We're going to do qualifiers and let's see what we, let's see what happens. <laughs> and um, in 2010, in that qualifiers, we ended up, um, we lost, I think by a point to Brazil and Colombia had never qualified for a senior level women's world cup before, never for the Olympics. Um, never for the Pan American Games. Um, so we just got the trifecta in a three-week tournament. Um, and then then kind of the rest is history at that point. Um, you know, just solidified myself as a starter and um, never relinquished that spot. Um, and, yeah, that was kind of how I, how I ended up getting there. Awesome. I, think it's so, I think it's important to point out how you just decided to, you know, take that risk take you know take that 
take yourself out of a comfort zone um, and, and really go for something. I, I, every, every time you tell me the story, I've heard the story a couple of times, but every time I hear it, it's just like, wow. Yeah. You know, that takes, that takes serious courage to do, you know, jump on a plane, go to another country, uh, even though it's, you know, where we're from. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we don't live there. So it's, it's, it's different. It's tough. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think, you know, I still love to hear that story. I tell kids, you know, all the time, it, you know, try to be, try to be a little bit uncom- uh, more comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think, you know, you'll be able to, to find solutions to problems that, that you can, that you didn't think you could find. Absolutely. Well, that's great stuff. We're running up on, on time. I don't know if you mind staying a little bit longer. Uh, we got some of the cute questions. Uh, we want to rapid fire through some of these. I have a couple of funny ones. Okay. Right, first, first funny one. How easy was it to show up Alan at the fa- family outings? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Alan, you crazy. Alan, she was on my team. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I was on his team so Luis would be on the other team. <laughs> yep, my brother would be on the other team. Um, All right. And then, no, see, Alan was always uh, much bigger than us, so we knew not to mess with Alan. Okay. <laughs> um, did you play against the U.S., and what was that like? Uh. I, I did play against the U.S. many times. Um, we were always in the U.S.'s bracket on every kind of major tournament. Um, and, I mean, it was, always, uh, it was always a game that had, you know, a lot of emotion for me and was always um, super exciting because as a, as a competitor, uh, I've, I've always loved and thrived. You always want to play against the best. Yeah. Like, there's no better measuring stick than – playing against the best and that's what the U.S. women are they're the standard they're the best and that's the reality around the world um and so for a lot of my teammates it was kind of more you know being starstruck a little bit because that you know these women um you know from a marketing perspective they're known throughout Mm -hmm. the globe um and that's rare for other parts of the world for a women's footballer to be known outside of South America I mean they may be the, in, these incredible talents that people don't really know about um, and you kind of get to know them in Europe but for the U.S. women I mean they're known globally so it was a little bit for them kind of being starstruck at first um, but for me it was you know I've, I played or I was on regional teams with a lot of these players national team circuits with a lot of them so I knew a lot of them um, but it was always just such a great challenge and um, you know I loved it it like I said it's there's nothing like um, you know, playing against the best, um, and, and also feeling some success when you play against the best. And like, there was also, um, a lot of times where, you know, people always tended to, um, doubt our style a little bit. Cause our style was very much ours. Like it was, you know, ball on the ground, very technical, um, small sided, you know, triangles and, and um, you know, kind of squares all over the all over the or quadrants all over the field, and it was just a unit, and we were tactically very good. Yeah. Um, and so it was always, you know, kind of exciting when we would frustrate them a little bit. Um, but um, but yeah, it was always a, a great um, opportunity, and I loved it. Um, and you know, we've had we obviously had some tough results um, against the U.S., but. Um, it's one of those things. It's one of those um, teams that who hasn't had a tough result really against um, one of the best teams in the world. So um, I always enjoyed it, and uh, I love the environment that they always created. Awesome. I've got to ask you this. Go ahead. Who did you always end up having to mark when you played them? So, and the first cycle, it was always. Um, I mean, it was always Abby Wambach because she was the biggest target for any ball in the air or any anything anywhere in the air <laughs> she would throw herself she was just the best the best aerial threat i've ever played against um, probably the best aerial threat in the women's game ever um so she was always my mark on dead balls um and but then the second cycle was always carly lloyd um for dead balls um, but then throughout the game, I mean, it just, it would depend, but those were like two of my assignments um, that, you know, were always, you know, particularly mine um, throughout both cycles. They trusted you. They trusted <laughs> you. 
what other sports did you like to play besides soccer? You, I know you mentioned basketball. basketball. Uh, I know Joe. Joe plays basketball. Um, my cousin, my cousin Joe, her brother. Um, yeah. Was there any other sports that you liked? Um, I mean, you know, uh, like my dad did a great job of kind of exposing us to a lot of different sports. Um, but the only organized sports that I played was basketball and soccer. Um, and I mean, I, I love basketball. So I would say basketball is probably, I wish I would have paid more attention to tennis. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I played the, those were the only two organized sports. Nice. Who was your favorite player, uh, professional player when you were younger? Ooh. Or growing up. Growing up. Why? So it's always, again, it's always just kind of funny because, you know, probably because, obviously because of the influence from my dad, um, I always had like exposure to like older players, like meaning he would show me tapes of like, you know, Brazil in like the 60s and 70s. And so like watching old tapes, like, I had old Ajax tapes that it was from the Ajax Academy that it was all Corver moves, right? Uh -huh. And it was Edgar Davids and Clivert that were like, these. they were like probably 18, like doing these videos. And so I would do them over and over and over again. Um, and so like, you know, it was kind of funny. It was like Brazilian influence and Dutch influence. So it was like that total football kind of influence that, that I was exposed to. Um, I don't, I don't know. I really didn't have like a player that I would say that I just loved. Um, it was always just kind of, you know, I loved to just watch oh, and have a favorite, I would say. I mean, like, you know, we all, I love, you know, I, it was cool because I love the, the Brazilian generation of Ronaldinho and Adriano and Ronaldo. I mean, like, they were just so fun to watch. Uh, but I don't know if there was one player that I was like, I did everything that they did. Okay. Um, did you more play with any, yeah, did you play with boys when you were in McLean? Um, not organized. So when I played with, with or when I played pickup a lot that was in high school and that was mainly through um since I went to high school um with a private school most of the kids that I went to middle school with they went to the public high school and so I actually would train with their high school boys varsity team like in the spring and that was with Edison high school so I would train with them there or I would train in the winters with um I actually trained with um, a club team, which was Team America at the time, uh, which was Clyde Watson, one of Clyde Watson's teams. Um, He's probably watching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love Clyde. Clyde was always, Clyde always challenged me and, you know, created such an incredible environment for me from that perspective. Um, Clyde also opened the door for me to train with the Washington Freedom in indoor soccer, like when they were getting ready for their seasons. Um, and I was like 15, 16 at the time. So I loved every, anything mm -hmm. indoor soccer was you know, great. So um, most of his uh, boys teams I ended up training with and they were with Team America. Um, but I didn't, did not play with any boys teams in McLean, no. Okay. Uh, was it tough, was it tough clicking with the national team players when you went to Colombia? Um, well, that was the other little point that I probably missed was that, um, so my first language was Spanish. Um, but as I went to school, um, I kind of lost or it was, you know, I didn't lose it, but it was a choice, uh, unfortunately. Not used as much. Yeah. An unfortunate choice that I made and my brother made, which was, um, we decided that we weren't going to speak Spanish anymore, but luckily our parents would always <laughs> probably scold us in Spanish. So we never lost the fluency to understand, but in order to converse, um, I knew that I had an accent and, you know, I was kind of, you know, ashamed of it a little bit. And so I really did not speak very good Spanish at all when I went to my tryout. Um, and even, you know, probably six months after that, <laughs> it was not great. Um, 
but my teammates were very, very welcoming. Um, you know, some of them were, some of them were not, you know, some of them were like, you know, who's the outsider, who's a gringa, who's the, mm-hmm. <laughs> who's the American girl <laughs> coming in here. Um, yep. And so, you know, but you're going to get that in a competitive environment regardless. So I didn't take it personally. I just took it as a challenge and I took it as, you know, okay, yeah, I, you know, I may subscribe and, and feel like one of you, but I haven't gone through the same experiences. So um, help me learn and, and help me. And so they were, they were just wonderful women that just kind of embraced me and embraced my ideas, embraced how I approach the game. Because again, I brought things to the table that they hadn't seen before, that they hadn't experienced, which was, um, I train like I play. So there's no, I'm full tilt, like all the time. And they're not like, it's very, you know, they like to dribble. They like the flair. They don't like to get hit. Well, that's not how you play the game all the time. Um, So it was a physicality. It was, um, you know, a training regimen. It was fitness. It was all those areas of the game that I didn't necessarily like, but I had to get good at and I had to embrace as I went into college. And as I got out of college, if I wanted to play at the international level, um, I knew that that was something that was necessary to get me there. And I helped bring that into that program. Um, and so it kind of brought us all closer together because there was just pieces that I wanted to learn more about, which is my language, more my culture, um, and that camaraderie, but it kind of made us, it made us closer and it also made us, um, just a great unit. Um, and so we were very committed to each other and to making sure that our country was always seen in the best light globally. And we wanted to kind of introduce the world to our style of play and to impact the women's game. And I felt like we really did that in 2015 with the Women's World Cup performance that we had. Um, And so that's what I think all of us are really proud of. And that we, and that for me, you know, I went into the program and I definitely left it in a better place than I found it. It's always been super important to me. Uh, So, so yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, a, a phenomenal experience. Awesome. What was your favorite game with the Colombian national team? I mean, you played in two World Cups, you played in two Olympics, you played in uh, two Copa America, Pan American games. Yeah. What, what was your favorite game? Why? Etc. So my favorite game would have to be in the 2015 Women's World Cup when we played France and we beat them 2-0. That was, yeah, that was that was what, you know, like, <laughs> that's where we that shocked the, the world. That's yep, that was where the top it of the was. Hey. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, at the time, at that tournament, that was, that was the biggest upset, you know, because that was – the number two team in the world and and that team was when I tell you they were stacked I mean that is still for me the best team player for player at that tournament um and that was just a phenomenal game that we put together tactically um you know defensively but it was a commitment and it was like we set it from before we got on the plane to go to Canada. Um, it was, we're going to make history and, and we're going to show the world what we have and how much talent that this country has. Uh, and I felt like that game really transitioned how people talked about us, how people viewed us, um, and, you know, took us a little bit more seriously. Um, and honestly, there was a lot of parts of the, of the game where we played against the U.S. in that tournament too, um, which we're all very proud of and that I'm very proud of because from that game, from what they learned from that game, they transitioned enough to win that tournament. And it was because of holes and gaps that we identified when we were playing them tactically that they adjusted. And, um, 
So that tournament in particular is just super special because all of us were at our peak, like all of us collectively, I think as players were at our peak. Um, and so that tournament, but that particular game is, is super special for me. Yeah, and I'll never forget watching that, you know, at home with the family. I, mean, I believe I got pictures of us. And I'm in my full out Columbia gear, but yeah, that was <laughs> super special. Super special. Let me just look here on the question, see if we really missed, did we miss any? There's some good ones at the bottom. Let's see. How old were you when you really started soccer? I know you said you really started training hard about eight. Yeah. Uh, when, when did you really start playing? Four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Young. Anandale Boys Grew up. Girls Club, four. <laughs> <laughs> No club. Dad made sure he had here's, all the balls all over the house. Yeah. Oh, uh, I guess it, if you had to choose one part of soccer that you didn't like, which part would it be? Ooh, fitness. Fitness. <laughs> no one likes fitness. No, no, that's not true. There's some that really do it, love that's it. That's true. They're that's just, true. They're engineered to have a third lung. I was not. <laughs> I was not. Give me a technical competition. Give me skills. Do that all day. Yeah. But, you know, put me on the line and do the beep test. No, thank you. Not my favorite. Here's a good one. Did you have any setbacks while you were trying to get recruited uh, to the national team? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I, I had, I had, um, I mean, I, I know that I tore my meniscus in high school. I just never did anything about it, <laughs> hmm. which didn't help when I went into college because then, you know, I had to get surgery in college. So I did have two arthroscopic surgeries in college on my left knee. I only have about maybe 10% of the cartilage left in my left knee. So I know that someday I need to get that, um, you know, figured out. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Besides that, those were mainly the only, um, you know, surgical setbacks. I mean, I did suffer from a little bit of plantar fasciitis because what's weird is that I have flat feet, which is kind of weird for an elite athlete to have, I've been told, but um, I do. And um, that was pretty bad my sophomore year of, um, of college. Uh, so yeah, it was weird. I was pretty, you know, very healthy and experienced just... You know, I was very lucky, experienced a lot of success before college, but I think a lot of the adversity that I, that I actually faced was in college. Well, this is a good one. I was going to actually ask this as well. Um, what role does soccer play in your life now? You know, I guess now that you moved on from pre professional soccer, do you still coach or do you still have a connection? So, um, so these types of opportunities uh i always love because this is an opportunity for me to give back to the game that gave me so much um so a lot of it is you know talking to my cousins who are coaching um you know i i also have um you know some little cousins that are starting to play or that you know want to be elite and you know kind of talk to me about training or you know that that kind of stuff um so, but in terms of me doing something regular, um, no, I'm not coaching. I, I, I did um, probably two or three years ago when I was still competing, um, I did train some small groups around here, um, boys or girls or kind of one-on-one -on -one training when I could. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't like, I don't coach on a regular basis or anything. Do like you that. play at all still like uh, in, in side leagues or Sunday leagues or anything like that? Um, I try to, um, but again, like nothing organized or nothing yeah. fully commit to. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, you have a pickup game. Sure, I'll show up. And, yeah. But um, but no, nothing organized uh, right now. But um, I know that that will probably increase again. Like, you know, <laughs> I always have that itch to play. And, yeah. um, you know, but I actually will end up, I'm, I'm that person that will end up and just go, you know, train on my own for an hour or two and kind of get that release and do it that way. Um, mm -hmm. So I still have, you know, a wall here in Atlanta that I know where to go to and kind of do the same routine. And um, so that's kind of probably how I get, I, I satisfy that, <laughs> that necessity to play. Okay. Well, uh, 
you have one, Alan? I, there's one by Avery that's pretty good. Um, yeah, that's the one I was going to ask. I, 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 I was going to frame it slightly different. If you go go back in time and tell yourself your younger self one thing in general, like what would you what would you say? Um, ooh, you can frame it as like general advice, I guess, for younger players. That's, that's a tough one. Yeah, yeah it's like super philosophical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let me think. Um, you know, I just, I just had a passion for this. Um, and I loved working through it. I loved the challenge of, you know, um, you know, I always had a competitive drive. Um, and so that I think fueled a lot of it, but, you know, um, with the combination of, you know, growing up in, in a home where football was religion, growing up with my dad, who was an elite player himself and having that kind of drive and desire to be the best and to be elite. Um, I basically was given kind of a roadmap, which was, you know, enjoy the journey, but work for it. You know, if you want something, go after it. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with dreaming, but if you want to be an elite player, if you want that scholarship, if you want to be on varsity in high school, if, if, you know, if you want to go to the premier team or whatever that may be for you, like don't put obstacles there for yourself. Just work at it every day and be consistent. For me, it was just about mastering your craft, seeing how far I could get with it, but also wanting to be elite and, and seeing from other, you know, getting ideas from other players or other environments, putting myself in situations where I wasn't comfortable, which is like playing with boys, right? Where it's going to make me play faster. It's going to make me um, not rely on physicality, not rely on maybe physical gifts that I may have, but it's just technique and it's just speed of play. So it's, you know, working on those things and, and repetition. And uh, so I think for me, it's just dream big, but go after it um, and do it with your whole heart and just be passionate about whatever it is. Um, but for me, I don't have, you know, I don't have any regrets. I was going to ask next. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any regrets in my journey. I feel like I was exactly where I needed to be. Um, and I made the most out of what I was given or, or the gifts that I was given. Um, but I worked for it and I sacrificed. Uh, but it was, like I said, I, I just loved doing it. It wasn't anything that I felt like it was work. Um, you know, at, you know, towards the end, you know, things like, let's just say fitness, it didn't come easy for me. Mm -hmm. I had to work at it. Uh, but you know, once, once you kind of put a regimen together and once you are consistent with it, um, you get a rhythm for it and you know, it's exciting to see what your body can do and how much you can push. Um, and that's what football was for me. And that's what, you know, my technical foundation was for me. It was how good could I get? Um, and how much could I impact players around me? Because for me, that was always like the sign of a great player was making everybody else around you better. Um, and so being a good teammate, um, learning those leadership skills, translating that to other parts of my life. I mean, you know, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the epitome of what we all want is to be able to transition this passion into something else. And, um, and yeah, so it, this is, this has been, uh, this has been great. I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy doing these things. Awesome. Nazi, thank you. I can't thank you enough. You know, I think um, hearing your story um, really can help kids, uh, you know, understand some of the sacrifices that go through and getting your goals. Um, it was great to hear about, about everything coming through your experiences and, um, you know, it, I uh, look out for the Jamil Natalie Allen camp coming and when she comes back <laughs> around the way in the summer. Um, and when you're ready to start coaching, girl, I got a job for you, okay? <laughs> you're going to be very, very, very good at it. Um, and I want to say congratulations. She's expecting. So big congrats. Can't wait to uh, meet the newest member of the family. Yeah. But uh, uh, thank you again. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. and. Um... And yeah, thanks. Like I said, I, 
I love any opportunity to give back to the game, to impact um, the youth any way that I can, um, because it's just about growing the game and making it more inclusive for everybody. Um, so this is great and I appreciate the platform and the opportunity. So if anybody has any other questions that maybe they didn't want to ask or they were too shy or whatever, please, my cousin is clearly not shy. So ask him. Yeah. I'll get it to her. <laughs> questions and yep. he's, he's not the shy one out of the two of us. So <laughs> he can, for sure. He knows I, think, I think it's important for them to know that they can, can reach out anytime. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yep. Yep. Please do. Yep. I'm, I'm here to help. I'm here to share in, you know, in my journey or help any way that I can. So, um, but yeah, if anything wasn't answered for you, please reach out because I'm happy to help. Fantastic. Thank you guys. I, I want to thank Jamil again. Thank you for being my co-host. Um, again, thanks to Nate earlier. Um, thank you for everyone watching. And again, if you got questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I hope everyone stays safe for the rest of this pandemic. Um, you know, and everyone is safe and hopefully the cities will continue to just try to love each other and yeah. keep it peaceful. Get back All to right, playing. everyone. Get back to playing. It's coming. It's coming around the corner. Coming. I can feel it. All right. All right, everyone. Appreciate everyone have it. a great night and I will see you all next week. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.